thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be back here at 5 by 15. Just a warning, I'm going to try some little tricks later. If you've got a calculator, if you've got a phone with a calculator on and you know how to use it, um, you could just sort of get it out and just sort of have it ready for the end. Um, okay, so um, that's my new book. And that's some of the topics in the book. And, you know, the miserable organizers wouldn't give me all five slots. So I've just got to choose one of those. But have a little look at those, because some of those you may find interesting. I think they're rather good. So I'm going to choose the nicest one, luck. OK, so I'm going to talk about luck. And I'm going to start by talking about my grandfather. There he is, Cecil Spiegelhalter, um, in the First World War, joined up in 1914. And uh, then he found himself in January 19, 1918 in what must have been one of the worst jobs you could ever think of. He was brigade gas officer for the Ypres salient just north of Passchendaele in January 1918. And he even had to do an exam to get this post. I mean, imagine it, because the, the life expectancy must have been incredibly low, um, because that was the sort of landscape in which he had to walk around using paths that had been targeted by the German artillery. And he kept a diary, and we've got his diary, and we can see him writing, desolation, narrow escape, lucky to get through in time. And uh, he lasted three weeks in the job, and then on January the 29th, 1918, in his diary, he records he went to Eagle Trench and Bear Trench, and on the way back, he was shelled. Okay, was he lucky or unlucky? Now, you can actually see that the diary continues, so you can see that he must have been quite lucky. Okay, so what is luck? Yeah, I like luck. It's the, it's the idea of the operation of, someone's called it the operation of chance taken personally. And it's all to do with things that happen to us that are unpredictable, that are not in our control, and yet have an impact upon us. So I, quite, I like that sort of definition. And, um, but we could just say, oh, something's lucky or unlucky. But in fact, we can take luck apart. Philosophers have deconstructed luck, and I really like this. And the first type of luck they identified is what's called constitutive luck, which is the luck of when you were born, where you were born, your parents, your genes, your early upbringing, everything over which you had zero control. And my grandfather had, the, in a sense, the bad constitutive luck to be born just in time, to be a grown-up male for a young male for the First World War. And then he had terrible circumstantial luck, which is whether you're at the right place in the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. And he was at this, must have been, you know, he was, had this awful job. He was at this crossroads or on this road by, on January the 29th when he got shelled. But... The final type of luck is outcome luck, how things actually turn out for you at that particular moment in time. And he was lucky. He was lucky because he survived. And he got, he it was a classified B2, went back behind the lines, and he was in, and so he missed his battalion being sent to the Somme in early 1918, a quiet sector then, but where late in March 1918, they met a million Germans coming across for the Kaiser's offensive. They had to counterattack, go over the top. He was a second lieutenant. He would have had to be first up the ladder, blowing his whistle with his men following him. And if so, I wouldn't be here. Okay, and he lived, to, lived till he was 81. Now, I'd like to describe, tell another story about someone I know. I knew my grandfather. Um, this is about, you may have heard about the 1949 plane crash of the Dakota, the DC-3, which flew into Saddleworth Moor, and nearly everyone on board was killed. Except one of the people who survived was my friend, Professor Stephen Evans, who I worked with on the Bristol Inquiry and the Infected Blood Inquiry and so on. Now, if we think of his luck, what did he have? He had terrible circumstantial luck of being on the wrong plane at the wrong time. He had good outcome luck because he was one of the few people who survived. Okay, so where was his constitutive luck? His constitutive luck was because he had a father who had been in the RAF and knew that the safest part of the plane was at the back. He insisted his family sat at the back of the plane. And they were some of the few survivors. Sadly, his younger brother was killed. So we can take apart our experiences, our, what we might consider random experiences, and see that there's different types of luck that apply. And then, of course, maybe the biggest type of luck is existential luck. As I said, if my grandfather, if the shell had been a bit closer, I wouldn't be here at the time. Now, if we think of what, you know, we might think, well, why are we here? And by what that I mean, I don't mean, you know, from great spiritual matter. I mean 
the nuts and bolts of your conception? You know, the sweaty bits. Have you thought about your conception? I mean, I must say, you know, if, te- if you really want to revolt a teenager, just get them to discuss their parents having sex. And if I, I'm 71, and I still find it really difficult to think of my parents having sex, but now they're not with us anymore, so I had to think about it. November 1952, I was conceived. I knew that Eddie and Faye Spiegelholz were living in an unheated, or just in a little bit of heating, um, certainly an unheated bedroom, in, um, in a stone cottage in North Devon. I checked the weather in November 1952 in North Devon. It was really cold. They were having a really cold snap. So what could they could do? They could stay up shivering listening to the Billy Cotton Band show or something ghastly on the radio, or go to bed and keep warm. And here I am. <laughs> so just think, this, all of you are a result of this incredible combination of contingencies that might easily just not have happened. And if you really think of... Um, existential luck as individuals. Of course, as a species, we've had massive existential luck because of this planet being hit by an asteroid 66 million years ago, which wiped out the dinosaurs, apart from the birds, and allowed mammals to develop. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here if that asteroid hadn't hit Earth. So it is extraordinary that any of us are here at all. Now, constitutive luck is fascinating, and I think most people would recognize that it plays a massive part in our lives. I mean, I've, I've, I live in a big house and I've got a nice pension and everything, and I could say, oh, well, I earned this through my skills and my hard work and everything. Well, to a certain extent, but a huge amount is because I was born in 1953 to a family that had no money, but I got, had a fantastic free state education at a grammar school, free university education with no fees, and then I could um, pretty well choose which job I took and then stay in it for 32 years, I could buy a house with three times my first salary, and, and so on. You know, my generation, you know, we had all the pies. We had fantastic constitutive luck, depending on when we were born. And so, and other people, of course, have not had that luck. They're born into really difficult circumstances. So once we accept that, the, the most we can say is that we should just make the best of the hand we've been dealt because it is incredibly important. People underestimate just how much, how important it is, just who you are and when you were born. And I actually quite like this phrase. I, 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 I have used it quite casually, but actually, I think it's actually very informative. I think it's a good analogy, because you are almost certainly unique. Your genes are unique, not just because of the chromosomes of your parents, the, the way they combined, you know, is, makes you absolutely unique. There's nothing like you um, ever or will be. Okay, just as, Every shuffle of cards is essentially unique. Okay, so I hit a pack of cards, I'm going to shuffle it up. No one in the entire history of humanity has done that shuffle before. <laughs> shuffle it again. No one in the entire history of humanity has done that shuffle before. Do you believe me? Okay, I'm going to show you. And if you had your calculators, you could go along with this, but you don't have to. Basically, how many shuffles are there? Here's a bit of sums. Okay, so the first card in a shuffle can be any one of 52 cards, can't it? And the second second one can be any one of 51 cards. So that's 52 times 51, just for the first two cards. Third one can be one of 50, and so on and so on. Now, how big is that number? Now, you could start clicking away on your calculators if you wanted to, to try to estimate that number, but you very quickly, your screen's too small, you're just going to run out. Because it's big. Actually, it's even bigger. Oh, it's bigger than that. Oh, I forgot the zeros on the end. Your calculator will not deal with that. It's 8 times 10 to the 67. It's about the same number as atoms in the universe. The number of unique shuffles you can do with a pack of cards. So I can be, I can't be logically certain but I can be certain, you know, as I used to say when I was a kid, I'll bet you all the money in the world. I'd put my life on it. That, those shuffles are never done before, which is quite surprising. So that's an event that people think is quite common, but in fact is unbelievably uncommon. Okay, so um, sometimes we can actually calculate how lucky someone is. Now, I don't know if you remember seeing Darren Brown in the system. It's a great program, and they filmed him flipping 10 heads in a row, clink, 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 clink. And they didn't edit the film. It really was a continuous bit of film. He flipped 10 heads in a row. Now, was he unlucky or lucky? What do you think? Nah, (laughs) okay, you think you know what I'm gonna do. Okay, so it turned out that he had had to flip for nine hours to get his 10 heads in a row. (laughs) 
which he owned up to later in the program. So he stood there flipping, and what a star, what a trooper. He did that, and of course, we only see the last clip when he actually managed it, but he had to make it look each time as if it was the first time he did it. In nine hours, he flipped for. And the point is that the probability that he would succeed at any particular attempt, the probability you get 10 heads in a row is a half times a half times a half, 10 times, about one in a thousand. So that means that on average, you'd expect to take about a thousand attempts, take a thousand attempts to get 10 heads in a row. Now, he took around 60, I, I worked it out by the timings, if he took nine hours, he must have taken 1,600 attempts to do it. He was unlucky. It took him far longer than he should have. <laughs> he was really unlucky to take so long. You kind of feel really sorry for him. Because my friend James Grime did it, and yet he did it in an hour. <laughs> it's on YouTube, the whole thing. It is the most tedious YouTube video you ever want to see, but at least it only lasts an hour. So he did it. So um, he was, we can, sometimes we can do some sums. And um, in fact, you can actually do the mathematics. This is what's called a geometric distribution. This is the probability of you flipping 10 coins, 10 heads, on each attempt right up to about 3,000. So the most likely time to flip the first 10 heads is straight away. And then the probability of having to wait this long drops and drops and drops. Darren Brown took that long. James Grime was up at the other end of the distribution. So we can measure, sometimes we can just measure luck to see how lucky we are. Okay, so I want to see, oh God, I've got loads of time left. All right, I, want to see, I, I wanted to see how lucky uh, we were tonight. So I did a little exercise where I went around um, and asked 23 people um, and I just picked 23 people from the audience who are around, sitting around here. They know, they know who they are. And first of all, I asked them the last two digits of their phone numbers. And what I was doing is looking for matches. So what do you think it's likely that out of 23 people, two of them would have the same last two digits of their phone number? Do you think that's quite likely or not very likely? <laughs> likely, yeah. Okay, there were two with 14. I don't know who they are if they're there. Two people I asked, yeah, Jay is one of them. Yeah, thank you very much. So there are two who ended up with 14, twins. Okay, that's very good. Now, I was pretty certain I was going to win that one because there's a 94% probability that if you ask 23 people, two of them will have matching. If you ask 20, it's 87%. So it's a, real, it's a good way to make money off people, just get 20 people. Their last two digits will match. Okay, then I really took a chance and asked them for their birthdays. Oh, what are their birthdays? And I know there's a 51% chance that out of 23 people, two will have matching birthdays. And that's, that's why on a fo any football pitch, with tw uh, 22 players and a referee, there's a 50% of all football matches will have somebody with, with matching birthdays. Similarly, in World Cup squads, I've got 23 people in them. So in half of all World Cup squads, um, two of them will have matching birthday. And in my book, I look at the women's, last Women's World Cup. There were 32 teams. Um, 17 of them had matching birthdays. Okay, so I failed. I failed. Nobody had the same birthday. But then I also looked at adjacent birthdays. And uh, we've got a March the 21st, um, no, a November 21st, November 20th, an August 20th, um, 10th, uh, 8th and August and 9th and January 29th and January 30th. So I had three adjacent birthdays out of 23, but I didn't have a match. So it wasn't a terrible failure, but I'm very likely to those some adjacent birthdays. Okay, I'm gonna finally do, I wanna see if you're rounded. The point is that randomness is clumpy. Things do not, are not equally spread when they're random. So in my last remaining times, have you got some, I wanna see how lucky you are. Have you got your calculators there? Has anyone got their calculator? Yeah. And you go, okay, in your calculator, just choose a three-digit number, like 576 or 231 or something like that, and just put that three-digit number in. Okay, is that all right? Now repeat it. Put it in again. So you've got a six-digit number with um, the first three numbers are the same as the last three numbers. I don't know what they are. So you've got a six-digit number. Now, okay, can someone give me a, a low prime, no, a lowish prime number? Anyone want to give me one? Too low, seven, thank you very much. Could you divide your number by seven and see if you're lucky and do you get a whole number left? Yes, yes you do. Can anyone give me a slightly higher prime number, please? 11. 11, divide your number by 11. Do you get a whole number? Yes. Yeah, give me another prime number, low one, but a, bit, a, bit, a little bit higher. 17. No, what, what, what's, what's the one above 11? 
13, 13, divided by 13. Do you get a whole number? And what's the number? It should be, okay, if you were lucky, or if I'm lucky, it's the number you started with. So, thank you very much indeed.